team, and it's wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for joining me here. Thank you, nice. Thank you for having me. So let's begin with how you are assessing the impact on operations so far as a result of the disruptions that we're seeing in the Red Sea and the Suez Canal. What does it mean for you operating one of the busiest and largest ports in the world here? There's no denying that if you look at the established networks of cargo moving from North Asia, Southeast Asia, Indian subcontinent into Europe and into the, even the US, and you take the Red Sea gateway out of the equation, you will see massive eruptions, disruptions, sorry, in the flow of things. And that is happening to us as well. Maybe a few specific examples to bring it to life. Um, the terminals in the Red Sea, and we have two, one in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, and one in Sokhna in Egypt. Of course, the cargo there hasn't found its way entirely to destination. But, you know, things are moving quickly. And we see, for instance, here in Jebel Ali, a lot of the smaller feeder lines, they are now picking up the cargo and find their way into the Red Sea. But we also see a number of flows that go all the way around the Cape Horn, go into the Mediterranean, and then get their cargo through the north side passage into the Red Sea. So there is some movement. I would say the biggest challenge is probably the European imports. This problem is now six, seven, maybe eight weeks old, and there's still a lot of inventory at sea. And so we see delays of cargo in the UK, in the main continent, although it will ultimately find its way. So there is a lot of disruption in many places going on. Indeed, and one of the things that we've been looking at is the overall impact on freight rates and shipping times as well. You said there's been significant delays. What does that mean for the cost of moving cargo and some of these 40 and 20 foot containers we see behind us? I think first and foremost, the shipping rates are up. We can all see that. Uh, we come out of a period where COVID saw extremely high sea freight. And of course the cost is up, you need more ships, you're gonna burn more fuel unfortunately. There's higher cost in the inefficiencies in the network. So ultimately the rates are going up, we see that, but it's actually nowhere near to where they were at their peaks during COVID. I must say that ultimately there is a higher cost and you know how that cost will find its way to the consumer, we'll have to see. One of the main challenges you also have here is building resilience into your operations. You mentioned COVID. Of course, we're also looking at the impact of the previous Suez Canal crisis, which was the ever given ship stuck in the Suez Canal. We see these multiple disruptions. How do you build resilience into your operations when you're working in an environment like this? For us, you know, it's a cliche, but the most important thing is to stay very close to our customers, the shipping lines. And the shipping lines, they live a day by day life making decisions on the network, what ports to call and where to go. And so what we want to do and are doing is we're very flexible on the windows we allow the ships in to help them recover. This is the only way you can help the shipping lines here in the short term. But secondly, we were also trying to create products, as I said earlier, of the smaller shipping lines, the common carriers, the feeders as we call them, to actually help to make that flow work into the smaller destination. Hmm. Is enough being done to safeguard commercial transit in the Red Sea, from your opinion? I think it's a good question. You know, it's something we can unfortunately not influence. We all have opinions about it. We would like to go certain, you know, think certain way. But ultimately, cargo will find its destination. It will just take more time and it's going to be a little bit more expensive in the interim. Hmm. One of the other things I know you're looking at as well is not just the disruption here, but also the disruption in the Panama Canal. This is more of a medium to long-term challenge for your industry. What are we seeing on the ground? Explain the disruption and why this is so critical as well. Yeah, the Panama Canal challenge is a very, very different one. It's a long-term problem because they simply cannot let the amount of ships through compared to the past because of the low water levels. And you can't just fix low water levels. You need a lot more rain and things like that. What we see though is customers are changing already simply because they can't pass through as much as they can. The networks are changing, they're also going south, but we also see new corridors emerging, both through Panama over land, but also many carriers are choosing Mexico as a way to get back into the US more quickly or more efficiently. So seeking alternative routes. Let's bring it back to the region as well. You mentioned how commercial shippers are responding to the challenges that we now see in the Red Sea and the challenges in the Suez Canal. What are you hearing from them specifically about how long this might last? Does it ultimately come back to the politics here or do they have some kind of timeline on what a typical disruption like this might actually end in? I think in this region specifically, the underlying demand for freight, for services, is the same. It's quite strong and it's quite buoyant. I think what everybody is thinking, quarter one is lost. 
in this whole game because it takes quite a lot of time, even if it would be solved tomorrow, to get the networks back on. It is, however, a short-term problem, and it's just something that we have to live through together. You think this gets worse before it gets better, though? No, I think kind of where we are now is a steady state because, as I said, the networks have adjusted, and cargo is flowing, bookings are taking. It just takes more time.